Okay, so Mahesh Rangarajan has a BA in History from the University of Delhi. He has an MA and PhD from Oxford University where he was also a Rhodes Scholar. This means that I should speak as less as possible lest I give away the lack of equivalent degrees at my end. <laughs> so all yours Mahesh um, and here's your lovely audience. Uh, I was asked to give a title which was uh, intriguing enough. So I thought history as if ecology mattered would be a good one. And uh, one good place to begin is with a good storyteller and I can assure you it's not me. In the year 2000, when magazines and newspapers still existed and were not a dying species, with the social media and web had to yet to make their appearance, a Carlo Cipolla was asked to write an article. And strangely enough, he wrote an article for an Indian newspaper. He was asked, what is the signif most significant thing that happened in the last 2000 years in European history. So somebody thought he'd write about a revolution or a war or an uprising, the Reformation, the Renaissance, the Crusades, whatever, he didn't. He said the single most important event in the last 2000 years of European history was the coming of the bean. So the next time you see Rajma, Chole and various kinds of beans, you can remember Chipola. And the reason Chipola said this, of course, would be known to all the parents in the audience, uh, particularly if you have children who are vegetarian, and even if they are not, you ask them to eat up their beans, because it's good for protein. And proteins are made of enzymes, and the enzymes have building blocks. And the building blocks, of course, include nitrogen. And one of the great struggles of cultivation, which goes back 12,000 years, depending on which part of the world you're in, interestingly, if you look at the history of agriculture, Cathy Morrison, who's done work on 3,000 years of the history of Vijayanagar, uh, reminds us that uh, Europe is a latecomer to the agricultural revolution. There's a big debate where agriculture began. Those of you who remember long forgotten history books will recall Iraq or Mesopotamia, and somebody will stand up and say, no, no, Jericho, Palestine. Recently, we know that a lot of the major crops which we are familiar with, such as potato, squash, tobacco, even chili, uh, came from the Andes. Miso America, it could be southern China. There are certain cultivars which come from India. Now, wherever they come from, they were not from Europe. Europe was a late comer. But the bean was very crucial to European history because the bean, as we know, is a leguminous plant. Among the nodes of its bacteria, of its roots, it's got various bacteria. And these bacteria pick up the nitrogen in the air and fix it in the soil. This was a major constraint on production in Europe until a certain point of time when, as Chipola tells us, the bean made its grand appearance. And then you get a threefold system in which there's wheat, oats or barley, and then, yes, beans are grown. The beans fix the nitrogen in the soil, and this enabled farmers or cultivators later to grow other crops. So one of the dilemmas of agriculture is that while it can support far more people per square kilometer than hunting, herding, and gathering, Agriculture, historically, has gone with herding. You see this in a very interesting way. In the university I work in, Ashoka, it's uh, named after a great Indian emperor, more of him later, and uh, it's situated in Sonipat, in uh, you know a sort of land that time forgot. You feel that uh, because we are part of something called the Rajiv Gandhi Education City, which is next to an industrial estate, which is almost from Dickensian times. You know, you can see the smokestacks and the smog long before you hit the place. But interestingly, very close to Ashoka, there are a lot of fields. And these are fields watered by a canal. This canal is a reminder of our history. It's called the Monak Canal. It's a very important canal for us in our university, for reasons you may not guess. When there's a major agitation in the state of Haryana, as there was in 2017, I was just a few years, few months young in the university, when I was one and a half years old. The agitators were cultivators who didn't just blockade the road, road, they cut off the canal. The cutting of the Monak Canal deprived North Delhi of water, believe it or not, for three months. Not all the water, they managed to get water from elsewhere. And when you went back and asked, when did they first cut the Monak Canal? Because the cultivators and peasantry were angry with the city of Delhi, it was in 1820. So it's very interesting. History reminds us of events which happened in the past which continue to affect us. The cutting of a canal because of protest reminds us that many of these areas would have supported far fewer people if not, if not for canal, 
or well or tube well based irrigation systems. But to come back to our friend the bean, one of the great dilemmas of agriculture is that agriculture needed nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. It's a very interesting book. I'm sorry, historians, we are talking bibliographies. You don't have to remember the name of the book or the author, but this is a point you might want to remember. If you were to ask a historian of the environment, what is the most important change that has happened in the last 100 years, you may come up with many answers. You may argue it is the coming of chlorofluorocarbons. Next time you open your fridge, until very recently, chlorofluorocarbons were used as refrigerants in the fridge. And chlorofluorocarbons, a very long name, my time is short, I'll use the short form CFCs. These CFCs are 24 times more heat absorbing than carbon dioxide. And CFCs were also resulting in the opening up of the ozone layer. This is a very important case to remember because in 1987, the countries of the world signed a protocol at Montreal. This protocol required the transfer of technology from the rich to the poor countries. It required companies to share the benefits of their technology. And you'll be happy to know that the ozone layer, which was opening up in the Arctic, the Antarctic, if I remember, I may get the geography wrong, the South Pole and the North Pole. Did I get it right? OK. Those ozone layers have closed. So it's very interesting that the environment can be a source of conflict, closing of Munak Canal. It can be a site of cooperation in the case of the ozone layer. But it can be an instance where solving one set of problems give ri gives rise to another set of problems. And here comes my other author. He's a very inspiring man. He's about to hit 80. His name is Vaklav Smil. And I think he's written about 70 books. Now, since he couldn't have been writing in his sleep, he must have started writing at the age of 18 or 20. He writes a lot of books. Well, one of them is called Enriching the Earth. And he argues that in the 20th century, world population increased, the GDP increased, the use of oil and coal widened, the internet came along, atomic power, atomic weapons came along. But if there were one thing to single out, which changed terrestrial ecology, the land we live on, and marine ecology, the waters, and the atmosphere, the air we breathe, it would be the ability of humans to fix nitrogen in the soil through synthetic means. Because all the methods that were tried, including our very good friend, the red kidney bean and all the beans, and the use of humus, mulching of the soil, the use of animal fertilizer, hit certain limits. And the nitrogen limit would be very crucial to the plant productivity limit. And the transformation would come in a country which would play a very important role in global history in the 20th century. It lost both the world wars, Germany. There were two men, Haber and Bosch. They did something very, very important. They synthesized ammonia. Now, ammonia is a very stinky thing. I am not going to tell you where you smell it in India in public places. You all have imaginations. You can use it. But ammonia and its synthesis enabled the production of chemical fertilizers. And Bosch and Heber were a very interesting pair because one of them, perhaps you know this, was a Jew. But both of them did something else which was equally important. The coming of ammonia, nitrogenous fertilizer, would transform agriculture. I just had lunch. I can't remember what I had for lunch. I had it very quickly, gulped it and ran here. I'm sure many of you have had lunch and those who haven't will proceed to do so. The chances are the lunch we eat has been made possible because of nitrogenous fertilizers. Nitrogenous fertilizers, however, don't always end up in your lunch or my lunch. They leach into the soil. Some of it stays there. They leach into the groundwater. Some of it stays there. They go with the surface runoff. It's a very interesting idea in ecology, articulated by the American ecologist, Barry Commoner. He said, Everything goes somewhere. It's such a simple point. When you say it, you say, hey, what's so great about that? And the reverse of that, everything goes somewhere, is there's no such thing as waste. The nitrogen, the nitrogenous fertilizer, which went in the water runoff into the ponds, the streams, the lakes, the rivers, and ended up in the sea, created, or rather helped create, large algal blossoms. Huge blossoms of, of algae. Looks very nice. If you see satellite readouts, 
you will see huge blooms of alga in beautiful colors, blue, green, red, all very dangerous because they are using up the oxygen and leading to the death of entire ecological systems. So there is a very interesting point which has happened in the 20th century, which is that much of the gains of the 20th century has been based on linear technologies. There was a problem. The soil had too little nitrogen. It had to be solved. You synthesized ammonia. Then you worked out how to make nitrogenous fertilizer and put it in the soil. But remember, everything goes somewhere. So one of the very important insights from the science of ecology for historians, or rather from the knowledges of the environment for anyone interested in the future of human society, is that change often has unintended consequences. But those unintended consequences can come back to bite. I'll give you a second equally interesting instance. But this one is intended consequences. Remember Haber and Bosch, German chemical industry was expanding. In the late 19th century, the Germans were involved in the fight with the British. I can't resist telling you this. Part of it was the Anglo-German naval antagonism. It is very difficult as a student of history to remember these things. So you went and found out something funny. Because history is also entertainment, as AJP Taylor said. So in the British pubs in those days, they used to sing a song, particularly after they had had some pints, bitter, lager, and other such wonderful things that inhabitants of the British Isles consume, then as now. They would sing a song. They were waiting for a ship called the Dreadnought, supposed to be an incredibly powerful ship. And they said, we don't want to fight. We don't want to fight, but by jingo if we do, we have the men, we have the ships, and we have the dreadnought too. What they didn't know is the Germans were about to breach a very important barrier in the history of technologies of destruction. Technology is not only about production, such as nitrogenous fertilizer. It's also about destruction. And Messrs. Herber and Bosch, or Her Herber and Her Bosch, to be correct, helped to synthesize mustard gas. Many of you may not have heard of Herber and Bosch. You may not know the formula for mustard gas. By the way, I don't either, but I'm not a chemist, am I? But you must have seen the film Wonder Woman, huh? Gal Gadot. That's actually based on a true story, not the Wonder Woman part of it. Mustard gas was used in the Battle of Somme. It's the first time that humans, the German Air Force, Army, all those guys, poisoned the air to kill enemy combatants. Some of the people who died were Indian soldiers. Indians were fighting in this Battle of Somme. So the 20th century is a history where histories of production, histories of weapon making, have given us the power not only to obliterate life, but also to bring about consequences for the life cycle, not just of some plants, a bunch of fish, some poor alga in some forgotten corner of the Mediterranean, but for the cycles of life itself. This is something which I think we've become much more conscious of over the last 50 odd years. And one of the reasons for that consciousness is that in the 20th century, much of the writing of history was about the search for peace or, if you like, the causes of war. Hmm. Causes of the First World War. Causes of the Second World War. Consequences of the First World War. Consequences of the Second World War. How do you achieve the peace? What is there to peace? Is it just the absence of war? Or is it about something much more than the absence of war? How can peace be lasting? How can you have peace between peoples? How can you have peace among peoples? I would submit that sometime in the late 1960s, many of these movements for transformation reached a crescendo. Uh, there's a book of Tariq Ali, former Pakistani revolutionary, lives in England. And he wrote a lovely book called Street Fighting Years. You know, it captures the mood of the late 1960s. Uh, they are captured by many people in many countries. And there are many causes which came to the fore. The cause of freedom. The war in Vietnam. Incidentally, herbicides were used on a vast scale in Vietnam. It's the first case of vast use of herbicides to obliterate entire forests. Some 10-12% of Vietnam was sprayed with herbicide so that the land would be rendered unproductive. It's also a time of the black power salute, if you look at the great photographs of the Mexico Olympics. In India, the Dalit Panthers, a lot of the uprisings around agrarian unrest were at that time. Two of the poster children, there are many, of the late 60s which have survived, one would be the women's movement, 
the movements against inequality on other lines. I refer to race, caste, class. But the other, I would argue, is the environmental movement. And the environmental movement has different forms, different shades, different dimensions. At times, it represents a Janus-faced god. So, you know, the Greek god Janus had lots of faces. Uh, one was supposed to point towards darkness and uh, to light, and the other was supposed to point to darkness. So there are times it evokes one, there are times it evokes the other. But I think the important thing about movements is that they not only challenge what we should do now, how we should prepare better for the future, they make us relook at the past. And if you add to the search for peace among peoples, the peace within peoples, the search for justice in terms of individuals, my right, I want to be free, my right to dignity, the right to dignity of people who have been subordinated or denied dignity, you add to that another equally difficult issue, which historically ethical systems, religious systems grappled with, which is the idea of equality with nature. What does it mean? Does it mean equality with the Bengal tiger? Maybe. What about the anaphylis mosquito? And since it's ravaged our lives so much, what about the COVID-19 virus? That's to put it at a very simplistic level. When we think of a peace with nature, we're not thinking of a peace for all humans with all other species. We are speaking of a larger dilemma, which is that just at the time when it's become possible for all people on earth to have a life of basic material dignity, it has equally become highly likely that the actions of some people, few people, many people, most people, all people, you can fill the blanks, you can pick one of the above or more than one of the above, may disrupt life cycles, local level, regional level, national level, global level, in a manner that negatively impacts not only ourselves, but generations of the future. So what happens to the notion of equality? When you think not only of other species, but other ecological systems and life cycles. What happens to the idea of equality when you think not of the person who is existing today, but of the future? I'll end on a very silly note. We once went for a school debate, and I think we were about to lose it. My junior was a very brilliant guy. It was on nuclear weapons. And everyone was, you know, giving statistics, how many weapons and all that. And he got up and said, uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, my worry is not that there will be a nuclear war and our lives will be obliterated. My worry is that for those of us who survive, such as me, I hope I'll make it, my grandchild may be born with 99 teeth and a tail. And of course, everybody laughed. And then he said, look, this is not a joke. This is actually a very serious matter. You're dealing with substances which have a half-life of thousands of years. You have any idea what the ethics of it? You have any idea what the politics of it should be? And of course, whether you have an idea of the ethics or the politics or the science, you need an idea of history. So the histories of the past won't give us answers to the future. Uh, as student of history, you're asked all sorts of silly questions. One of the most interesting questions is, what are the lessons of history? Well, there aren't any. There aren't any. It's not a morality play, the good guys and the bad guys. History gives us insight. It gives us a sense of how we got to where we are. It gives us a sense of why we are at a crossroads. And it can inform the kinds of choices we make. Beyond that, history is about debate. Remember Carlo Cipolla? If someone else were asked another, the same question, they may give another answer. But how can we have a history as if ecology mattered? How can we think of human existence, pasts, presents, futures, not only as if other species mattered, but if, as if other life cycles mattered? In the age that we live in, I don't think this needs uh, elaboration for an audience such as this. I have no idea of the time. Does anyone know the time? Oh, we have 10 minutes. So there's time for questions. Uh, you know, capitalism would have been a more interesting uh, or, a, or a higher impactful imp or a, a rather uh, a bigger impact on the environment and the eco and the wars and whatever? Depends on your perspective. I would agree with you that can debate whether it goes back 500 years, 250 years, 150 years, depending which part of the earth we are in. I also agree with you for a second reason. I think that one of the longer term deep impacts of capital is not about labor and capital. It's not about workers and industrialists. This was a period when it became possible to take these technologies and invest in these technologies. And you could possibly say that the Haber-Bosch process, which was done for the firm of Bayer and Bayer, 
is the success of German capitalism, but it also was very important in the history of the earth. So yes, we can cut this cloth in different ways. Uh, the reason I picked up nitrogen, and I'll, I'll be very frank, is that uh, we're all hearing so much about carbon. So I thought, let's change the picture. Let's just change the element and we'll get a very different picture. It also relates to everybody. Everybody here may not have used fossil fuel transport. Some people may have walked here, but everybody must have eaten something, hopefully in the last 24 hours. But yes, that's, that's a very important question and we can come back to that. Uh, Bruno Latro argues that the greatest mistake of modernity is to believe that we are the only sentient beings in a largely insentient world. And, and Jane Bennett in her book Vibrant Matter takes that further to say that the sentience of nature uh, becomes evident in a recalcitrance that can be seen in larger time scales. And therefore we need a politics that uh, acknowledges the sentience. Do you have any guidelines to offer on how we can go about recognizing the sentience? See, uh, between Jane Goodall in the 60s and now, there's been such a wealth of work on primates, on elephants, uh, interestingly on birds, uh, on octopuses, that modern sciences, including those of looking at animal behavior, today would remind us that many of the qualities that we associated with being uniquely human are not so. So if I can turn that around, uh, it is true that many cultures, oral and literary, had a conception that animals are possessed of emotion, of affect, of grief, of longing and all of that. However, however, this period of the last 60, 70 years has been revolutionary in terms of our understanding of similarities and differences between humans and animals. In fact, I am struck by the fact that it's not my original point, that many of the arguments used to justify brutal or inhuman behavior with animals, that they don't have reason, that they're incapable of emotion, and etc., were those used historically to deny women, barbarians, colonized peoples, people who looked unlike you, or people who live differently from you, their rights. So I'm not suggesting it's animal rights. But my submission is that modernity has many dimensions. This is a very deep observation by great scholars. But, uh, you know, the events of history always surprise us. The same modernity which may deny sentient being to the creature on which mustard gas was tried, also over the last 70, 60 years, has given us new ways of looking at animal consciousness, which has implications for humans. Those of you interested, you know, uh, there's a remarkable book called Our Inner Ape. I have never had a group of students read it, not come back and say, it's the most incredible book they've read. It, among other things, showed that chimpanzees have a male-centered society, and the bonobos have a female-centered society. And, well, there's no believe it or not, chimpanzee society can be vi very violent. Bonobo society is almost 99% non-violent. And of course, this author then goes and asks why. And one answer is that humans, as hominins, share the legacies of both the chimps and the bonobos. So rather than show us that we are totally unlike them, it shows us we are like both and of course we are different from both. So I would argue that rather than look at the modern purely in a negative sense, which would be a flip mirror image of the old way, where we simply look at it in a positive sense, we ought to look at it in a multifaceted way. And one of the interesting things about the historical craft it is that it prepares you for a lot of things. One thing it cannot prepare you for, and should not, is surprises. And not all of them are all bad. Uh, uh, I'm a student of eco-criticism. I have this doubt since a lot of time, but then as we were talking about the same thing, I would like to ask this as a guideline. I would need a guideline wherein uh, what can be done, say we have history, we are in the present, and we have future also. But whenever we look at any environmental issues, the time is not instant. Say global warming, nothing will happen tomorrow, right tomorrow. But then the time frame is too long. So what can be a guideline for a writer or with literature perspective? How can we uh, bring that sense of uh, uh, a time saying that, OK, maybe for me, nothing is going to happen because of the chemical war that's happening today or tomorrow. But definitely, it's going to affect the entire human race and the entire world. So how to bring that far-fetched timeline into a shorter one? The United States in 1980 elected. The man who at that time was the oldest ever president of the United States. They've broken that record since. 
and ronald reagan as we all know was a believer that communism was evil he also believed that with an arms race he could bankrupt the soviet union now it so turned out he got a person on the other side who gave him some incredibly far reaching proposals for disarmament now for a variety of reasons these two men came to an agreement 1987 is the first time ever that nuclear weapon powers agreed to withdraw nuclear weapons and to decommission them so from 1949 to 1987 there was a nuclear arms race the two most powerful countries were building more and more and more bombs there are many reasons for this one of the positives which i should share with you this afternoon is that between 1987 and now i'm not making this up 87% of the nuclear weapons on earth have been decommissioned 13% is still a lot they can blow it up many times now why did they do this there are many reasons but one of the reasons is that there was much more awareness of the dangers of nuclear war among the younger generation and among aware people not only in their countries but all over the world so jonathan shell wrote a remarkable book called the fate of the earth now everybody can't write as well as jonathan shell uh, maybe ma'am you can some other young people in the audience young is used here uh, you know culture you know spiritually not chronologically jonathan shell had argued that a nuclear war will not mean the death of life it will mean more than the death of life it will mean the death of death it will mean a planet where civilization as we know it ceases to exist and somewhere i would like to think that these movements this consciousness seeped into the minds of someone like reagan hardcore believer in the cold war gorbachev who remember was a hardened communist and these men changed now today history may judge them as plus minus in many ways so my submission is writing creativity literature the arts historically has played an enormous role in the most important thing which is which is in the way people think and when you talk ma'am of future changes which we can't see future changes which we will never see you know who cares what happens in the world 2100 it is the power of the imagination of people that has to be unlocked so i think you have a great gift and i i i hope you and others go on with it thank you very much i'm sorry we've run out of time thank you <laughs>